together or yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think your, your question is asking about how can one really be certain that the clone came from the nuclear donor and wasn't, say, a pregnancy in the surrogate mother. And one way is to use different species, as you described, the Labrador retriever and the Afghan. In mice, one does that by using genetically marked animals. So there can be an animal that has a different set of genes that's put into the foster mother, and then one can be certain about the, the provenance or the origin of the clone. It's a good question. Yes. Um, have you, when doing these experiments, have you come across any kind of deformities? And if you have, what kind were they? Yes. Uh, it's, I'm glad you asked that. I didn't mention that studies in mice where they, they've been, uh, it's been possible to look most carefully at the clones strongly suggest that the clones are not entirely normal. It's difficult to be certain as yet because one needs large numbers of animals to really help us define normal. One way to think about it is if I said, who in this room is normal? It would be hard to sort of to, to say with any certainty who's willing to say, I'm an example of a normal human being. Similarly, if I showed you the mice, they all look normal, but they might have subtle differences. And that's an active area of experimentation. Yes, there. Um, since cancer is caused through the de-differentiation of already differentiated cells that wouldn't this process of cloning put the clones at a greater risk of cancer since you've taken a differentiated cell and given it its, its full potential again? Um, I don't think it would put clones at greater risk for cancer. You're right that cancer involves a change in the genetic composition of cells. And so you might be thinking that by reprogramming them, if you don't do it entirely accurately or, or with real fidelity, you could open up that cell and its, and its progeny to some susceptibility to cancer. There's no evidence for that at the moment, but it, it is a possibility. Now you, unfortunately, are way in the back, and I can see if I can reach you. There we go. Yes, here. Um, you said that the frogs that were smaller, that was due to um, the fact that they didn't eat enough or whatever. So why, when the cows were cloned, did they not have, look exactly the same as each other? Yes, yeah, so you noticed that the cows didn't have the same spot pattern in their coat. I'm pretty certain that cows are like cats in that regard, and that the patches of the skin result from random inactivation during development of the X chromosome. And since that's a random event, they'll all have skin, but the color coding will be slightly different. In fact, I'm told that the person who paid to have her cat cloned was upset because the coat pattern wasn't exactly the same. Uh, there we go, over here in the green sweater. Why did the cells, uh, when you put them in the egg cell, why would the nucleus not change that cell to be the function that it was before? Why would the cell change it to be de-differentiated into a stem cell? Right, that's a, a great question because it sort of asks in another way, who's in charge of the cell? Is the cytoplasm telling the nucleus what to do? Or is the nucleus calling all the shots? In fact, there's an interaction between the two. And factors that are found in the cytoplasm, transcription factors, for example, proteins that turn genes on and off, go into the nucleus, turn some genes on. Those will then go into the cytoplasm and change the whole composition. But it is undeniably the case that in this context, when a nucleus is put into an enucleated egg, the egg cytoplasm is calling the shots. If it weren't, then one would have just made more intestinal cells in that first experiment. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, here. Um, I was wondering, the cloned animals, although they look and have the same like uh, genetic material and the same coloring as the parent, do they have the same personality? Is, or is their personality drastically different or just sort of different? Right. Well, I worked with frogs for a long time, for 10 years, and could never detect any hint of a personality. <laughs> but. Um, your question is a good one. I would be willing to bet that the answer would be no, because your personality is not hardwired in your genes, but is a consequence of all of your interactions with your parents, with your siblings, with your classmates. So that's sort of what I meant when I said that DNA is not one's destiny. It's interaction with the environment that has a lot to do with what we all become. So thanks for those great questions. We're going to move on now, and we'll have time for questions later. I want to finish up talking less about what has been demonstrated so far 
and more about the future, following up on my challenge to you all to join us in this field to try to find new ways for treating disease. And in order to do that, I'm going to show a slide which I'd like you to keep in mind, which is the sort of circle of a research program of how to combine cloning and stem cells in studies on disease. In this slide, you see a patient up in the upper left. And we're going to talk about experiments where the nucleus from a skin cell of the patient is used in nuclear transfer to create embryonic stem cells like we described yesterday. You'll remember then that following nuclear transfer, a blastocyst can be grown, and from the blastocyst, the inner cell mass can be used to derive embryonic stem cells. The two aspects that I want to concentrate on are first, using embryonic stem cells to make special types of cells. That's shown there where it says genetically matched differentiated cells. And then I'm going to finish up with talking about using these cells to study diseases in a Petri dish, essentially moving the study of degenerative disease from patients to a Petri dish. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times degenerative diseases, and I'm going to bunch them all together today, even though technically that's not the right thing to do. But they have some things in common, and I'm going to show you some examples of degenerative diseases and tell you why we think that these can all be studied using stem cells. So by degenerative disease, I mean to group together all of the afflictions that affect people as our bodies age. And this would mean purposely to include, say, all of the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is sometimes abbreviated as ALS for amyotropic lateral sclerosis, and I'll just refer to it as ALS today. Cardiovascular disease, the degeneration of the heart that Nadia talked about yesterday and diabetes, a case I'll focus on where particular cells in the pancreas are lost. Now, in all of these cases, these diseases have a few things in common. First, they are not the result of a single genetic defect. Instead, they're the result of many genes being combined to make the patient susceptible to getting the disease. And secondly, they all involve an interaction with the environment. There's some environmental signal, and almost all of these cases unknown, which results in the eventual progression of the disease. But one thing they have in common is that in every case, these problems come crashing down on a single kind of cell. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Think about the case of Alzheimer's, which affects the brain. In this case, it's the four brain basal neurons, as they're called, which become defective. And in this slide here, I black those out. They become defective, leading to memory loss and then other more serious problems as the disease progresses. Relatedly, in the disease called Parkinson's, it's not the forebrain neurons, but the midbrain neurons that make the chemical signal dopamine, which are lost. So here you see in the midbrain, cells going away. A disease I'll say a bit more about, ALS, is one in which motor neurons become defective. So the motor neurons innervate or talk to the muscles of the body. And so without that, all muscular control is eventually lost. So here you see the motor neurons sort of being blacked out as the disease progresses. In cardiovascular disease, it's quite obvious that unless Nadia figures out how to regenerate the heart soon, these cells are going to be degenerating. And you see here, I have the heart blackened in a bit. And I want to take the example of diabetes, where a particular cell in the pancreas the insulin-producing beta cell is lost. I'm going to use this as an example, then, to ask the question, how, one might, how might one use an embryonic stem cell to make a specialized cell type to replace it in patients that are missing or have defective cells of a certain type? So the cell we're talking about here, then, harkens back to the pancreatic islet, the endocrine portion of the pancreas that makes hormones. And in this case, that is the case of type 1 or juvenile diabetes, the insulin-producing beta cells are lost because the body makes a big mistake and the immune cells attack one kind of cell in the body, these beta cells, and kill it off. So if you watch carefully here, the blue cells are going to go away. No insulin can be produced in these patients. And so diabetics, as you may well know, have to take blood tests five to 10 times a day in insulin injections in order to survive, because their body doesn't have the capacity to make this necessary hormone, insulin. So if we take that as a puzzle, on the one hand, you have diseases where there are cell types missing, in this case, the pancreatic beta cell, and you'll have cells which can make any 